Here we have um, the red line is sub-Saharan markets from 1990, same time period as Nick, and this is sub-Saharan Africa ex-South Africa in dollar terms, market cap weighted from 1990. The red line is, South Af is sub Saharan Africa. The blue line is uh, the MSCI developed markets, i.e. North America, Europe, Japan, Australia. And then the green line at the bottom is the frontier markets. So everyone thinks, hey, the frontier ones. Oh no, it's as, as Nick has said, is you want to look at the numbers and buy at the right time. Don't overpay, is that right? The wrong way. Here we have the MSCI China and Africa emerging market indices in dollar terms. It's just for these for the people who aren't particularly aware, but sub-Saharan Africa is the blue line. The green line is Eastern Europe, which has been a go-go area. And coming down, as Nick was saying earlier about GDP, growth production, and whatever, does it translate into shareholder returns? No, the answer is no. And the other two lines are the Shanghai market, uh, the Chinese market as, as by the Shanghai Composite, and the Far East Index, which is MSCI. Ooh, this is interesting, because it's got lots of opportunities here. This next one is what I call the big disconnect. It's the Nigerian market and the price of oil. It's always good to have something which, you can, which is a proxy for your market, which is easily um, identifiable. And you can see from 1990 through to 2008, the Nigerian market in, in red and, uh, the, um, and, and the Brent crude price in, in dollars tracked each other's fairly well until the crash of um, 2008. And since then, the price of oil has risen and the Nigerian market is slowly making progress up. But so, one of a better name is, what do I call this type of graph? Well, I called it the big disconnect. Because this is highly identifiable. Nigeria's oil production is little changed over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and, but the market, stock market's buoyancy has not come back in. And there are good opportunities. Or there should be, because if the index hasn't, re hasn't recovered, some companies and sectors are underperforming. This graph, this table here, um, has on the left-hand side all of the, all of the sub-Saharan markets uh, de descending, in, um, descending from Nigeria, which is the biggest of them, through to Kenya, and then down through to the bottom. Um, the key one here, the yellow there, you can see, which you see, is actually equity returns of the index of more than 25% in any one year, in that year. So, 2013 and 2012 were stellar years. So far, so far year to date, in 2014, Tanzania is the winning market. It's up 45%. The Tanzanian market I visited 18 months ago with my, with my partner, and we were just surprised. Two banks open. One was trading at one times book, and the other was trading at 1.5 times book. Compare that with the, uh, with the Kenyan banks next door. Double in price. And I thought, hey, this is good news. So there we are. That's one of the reasons. Is that my, telling me my time is up? The next one here, it's, I hope you can read it to, towards, especially to the back. What it's got here is the, is the return on equities of the banks in, uh, of some 50 companies spread across sub-Saharan Africa, ex-South Africa. So the return on equities on the left-hand side is zero, and on the right-hand side here, is, that's 55%. Here you've got a um, three times book, and then you're going up to about five or six times book here. But what you can see is there is a direct correlation, there's a strong correlation of return on equity and price book. So you can see down here, Union Bank Nigeria. Anyone heard of Bob Diamond? He's just bought a chunk of that. So I think he's being quite opportunistic. 
buying something which is basically just above break even, and he's buying it at a big discount on book. Then you go through here, met a lady from First, uh, First Bank Nigeria, she's over there, she's there. Um, then you've got uh, some Kenyan banks here, you've got CRDB, sorry that's Tanzania, and you've got KCB here, you've got Equity Bank, and uh, a clutch of Kenyan banks there. Then as you go further up here, you've got the Botswana banks here. Look, 35% return on equity. They've got 4% inflation. And they've got a 35% return on equity. It's not only this year, it's the previous year. And you go back, is they're consistently at this level. Then you come to some outliers here. And you've got the two Ghanaian banks here. You've got EcoBank and Standard Chartered Ghana here. They're doing a 45% return on equity. It's not surprising because treasury bills are um, at 20, 22%, and they're paying their depositors 3 or 4%, and the rest is oh, margin. So what we're saying here is from this type of work which we're doing is we can find the overvalued stocks which are implicit in this, and we can find the undervalued stocks in it. And then we can say is, do we really like Sky Bank down here, which is a 70% discount to book. There must be a better reason for this. And I remember someone saying is, do your due diligence to find out. There's always a reason for, shall we say, a serious, a serious undervaluation. Um, but anyway, that's, that's for, the, for, for the more, shall we say, bloodhound people. The next one, slide is the same type of slide, except it is the manufacturing companies. And these are big cap companies. Nestle Nigeria, uh, $4 billion. Nigerian breweries, um, $6 billion, um, $7 billion. Dangote Cement, $20 billion. These aren't small companies. And they are getting, they are earning a 20 25, 30% return on equity. And so it's the same, same process. Take Dangote sugar here. It imports sugar, sugar prices are falling, and therefore their margins should be rising. And it's undervalued. Oh. So will they be able to improve their margins and from that raise their return on equity? The answer should be yes. The good thing about the Nigerian stock market is for all of the companies, they do quarterly reporting. So you can go from quarter to quarter to find out what's happening. So you don't have to wait for six months or so before um, a report, um, an earnings report comes in. You can actually, it's a bit like taking uh, the patient's temperature. You can do it every three months instead of every six months. So, I'm in the, uh, for, because of time, is the key features of the markets, they follow the economics and the politics. And the politics has improved, and the economics is, has improved. Inflation has fallen, it's at multi year lows in many of the countries. You have good corporate governance and improving corporate governance. Now, I'm just going to fast forward a little, and Nigeria. Per capita income rising rapidly. This isn't GDP growth per se, it is per capita income. And you're seeing this getting translated into sales increases by companies. Kenya, likewise. Um, what I haven't incorporated into this is the rebalance, is the rebasing of both Kenya and Nigeria of their GDP. So actually, they're, um, they're their per capita incomes will be rising proportionately. And the next one, which is one which I do like, is Botswana. Little country, good population, medium-sized population, but also is it's got one of the highest per capita incomes in the, in, in the continent. You're talking just under $10,000, which is almost, it's 50% it's more than neighboring South Africa. Do you want, should we say, a brewery in South Africa or a brewery in um, Botswana. And it comes back to the point you were making, Nick, about Delta Corporation and Sashava. They are identical companies. They brew beer and they have a Coca-Cola franchise. And they do Chibuku. 
it's, it's, it's an identical company. One is bigger than the other, but the, but, but the Botswana one is twice as profitable. And I think this comes down to your answer to, to help square your circle when you were looking at the companies is it's a function also of the return on equity, what people are, being, what people are, are paying for to acquire the shares. There we are. Thank you.